Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is May 14th, 2014, and um, Kevin Hodgins, one of our friends here, uh, said, hey, I'm in a new book. You want to invite some people and let's um, meet some poets? And, and uh, we have the, one of the editors of the book with us here tonight, too. So Kevin, thanks for that t tip. Um, and the book is called Teaching with Heart. Um, and then there's a long subtitle, Poetry That Speaks to the Courage to Teach. Is that close? I think hey, got close. it. Nailed it. <laughs> uh, Samuel, why don't we uh, jump in with you? Uh, you're one of the co-editors, I think. And um, you introduce here who's with us here tonight. I, I, I love shows like this where we get to meet some new people. So welcome to Teachers, Teaching Teachers, y'all. So Samuel, introduce yourself. Great. Uh, my name is Sam Intrader. I'm currently principal of the Smith College Campus School and um, a faculty member at Smith College in the Department of Education and Child Study. How big is your school? What's your school like? Uh, we are a K-6 school, about 270 students. Um, mm -hmm. It's a laboratory school, which means that we are a place where um, we introduce many, many students, undergraduates and graduate students, to the profession of teaching. They get to engage in, you know, really in-depth uh, exploration of what it means to, to get up there in front of a classroom and work with kids and work with colleagues. Um, we're also a place that, you know, prides itself on trying to, to sort of think deeply about reflective practice and be innovative about curriculum. And, you know, we work with lots of faculty members, and it's a place where I think um, everybody sort of surrounds the idea of, of really scrutinizing what it means to teach and you know move curriculum and and you know engage in lots of great conversation about you know the work that we do. Cool. How long has the school been around? It's been around it for about what the show is about, but hey. Yeah, but it's around, it's been about eighty-seven years that we've been um, we've been we've been around and. Uh, it's a place with lots of traditions. It's a place with lots of really wonderful teachers that you know are are so deeply invested and in thinking deeply each and every day about um, what it means to be a teacher. So it's good stuff. Cool. And that's some of what the book is about. Is that what you say, or? Yeah, you know the book. The book is um, the book is a collection of ninety submissions. And what's really neat is that uh, you know we we had a, a call, and the call goes out, you know, on email listservs, it goes out um, through people that we know, and what we're asking is for teachers to identify a poem that was truly meaningful to them, a poem that speaks to how they think about their work, and um, then what we ask them to do is, is write a companion piece, a little commentary that describes their relationship to that poem. How does that poem inform their teaching? How does that poem help them understand what it means to be a teacher in today's today's day and and in their own life and uh, it's these you know sort of two pieces working together as sort of like siblings this poem and this you know really often heartfelt evocative commentary that you know comprise the book and you know that's been um, it's a um, it's a format that I think speaks deeply to readers because um, they don't know where to begin should I begin with a poem by Walt Whitman or should I begin by a commentary by Glendine Hamilton, you know, writing as a first-year teacher in, um, you know, as a Teach for America uh, core member. So I think that that that's the kind of um, you know narrative that we're trying to have the book uh, open up. Nice smooth introduction there. I like that. <laughs> Glenn, Glendine, yeah. do you want to if you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi everyone. So um, thanks for joining us tonight. So my name is Glendine Hamilton and I am currently a Teach for America Corps member. I teach in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Um, prior to joining Teach for America, had a distinct honor of attending Smith College and being an advisee um, to Sam and Trader. Um, what, under Sam and while at Smith, um, I was a double major in government and education. Um, my major in education allowed me to have many teaching experiences. My most poignant teaching experience was when I taught eighth grade English in Springfield, Massachusetts as my student teaching practicum. Um, it was during that time in which I was asked to be a contributor to this book and I wrote my piece on how to understand my teaching experience, my experience with my students in the context of just 
my overall life and the work that I am committed to every day. So I'm happy to be a part of the book. Cool. So we, I, I have not t let you guys know this, but we will be asking you to read your poetry if uh, you want to, but we'll get around to that. Kevin, introduce yourself in this context. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everybody. So I'm Kevin Hodgson. Um, I teach sixth grade in Southampton, Massachusetts, um, and I'm part of the Western Massachusetts Writing Project. Um, and we were kind of talking about this beforehand, but uh, Sam and I actually don't know each other. You know, we kind of, I don't know if you live in Northampton, Sam, but we kind of at least are in the same circles, although we never run into each other. Um, and, um, you know, I actually, um, this is the, Sam, you correct me, but I think this is the third collection that you put out. Is that correct? Yeah. We, okay. we, the first one was Teaching with Fire, and it came out about 11, 12 years ago. Yeah, and so that's the book actually I picked up. And, um, you know, I had no idea there was even a Smith College uh, connection to it. I, somebody had recommended it um, to me when I began teaching, because I came to teaching after another career. Um, and I really loved the format of the uh, teacher essays that kind of then led into uh, poetry. So, Paul, the format is that teachers kind of write so uh, essays, but then share out um, a published poem of somebody else. So we're not we're not the ones actually oh, writing the poem. I, okay. I had, I had yes. Thank you for correcting me. Yeah. I, but you can still share a poem. Oh yeah. Um, so, but but reading those pieces. No, I had um, imagined that you had based your poem on the poem that was shared out, but that that's okay. That's another okay. idea. That's the next one. Sorry. <laughs> that's right. Fourth book. Um, but but that book was, and I still have it in my bookcase over here because I pull it out from time to time. It was just really uh, powerful for me, particularly as a, a you know a teacher trying to find my feet too. Um, and uh, there were some writing project teachers who contributed that too. Um, that I kind of became part of my circle too. So, um, so when I saw the call for this one, I was like, oh, I remember Teaching with Fire. <laughs> and of course, I still didn't have the Smith College Northampton connection at all. To be honest, it was only recently when I realized, oh, Megan's writing from Northampton. That's where I am. Um, <laughs> but, um, but that got me thinking, oh, I should try to write a piece for that. And so that's kind of how I got into it. Cool. Great. Um, go ahead, Will, and then we'll get to find out who Megan is here in a second. Yep. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so my name is Will Bangs. I also live in Western Massachusetts, and I teach in North Massachusetts in the house tonight. Right? Yeah. 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 And where are you, Paul? I'm in New York City. Oh, cool. Okay, um, that's my home, so I'm okay. with you. Okay. So this is my uh, fourth year teaching sixth grade humanities, and oh, where to begin? Um... I'm really glad we're having this conversation tonight because this time of the year, at least for me, can sometimes be the hardest. You know, the weather's beautiful outside, MCAS is over, um, you know, all my old college buddies or people who are still in college, you know, living in a college town, everybody's getting out of school early, and the kids <laughs> are antsy to be out of school, I'm antsy to be out of school. And it's really nice to come back to, you know, sort of the heart of the matter of why we do what we do. And to me, that's what this collection is all about. Um, I had both of the um, first two collections of poetry um, that I had right on my desk for my very, and they're still there on my desk, um, you know, alongside some of my favorite novels that I work on, you know, with my students. And it's just such a nice collection of poetry to come back to. Um, not only because it's short and sweet and can give you a nice dose of inspiration when you really need it, but it's also really nice to know that, you know, the struggles that I might feel as a, as a new teacher is not mine and mine alone. It's a struggle shared by many other teachers, and I think that sense of camaraderie comes through um, really powerfully in this collection, and uh, yeah, it's just a pleasure to be a part of it, and it's uh, the perfect time here for this for this sort of conversation to have, at least for me, um, because this can be sort of the the toughest part of the year to get through. Um, yeah. Well, what's what's the de what are the details you may have said, but I missed them of where you teach and what age and so forth. And I work at city, but, yeah. I work at the middle school in Northampton. Uh, mm -hmm. I teach sixth grade. I'm a humanities teacher. Um, this is my fourth year there. 
You're not new anymore. Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I feel I still feel like it, but well. I'm just we're all yeah, we're new for a long time. Yeah. yeah it's cool. <laughs> Great. So, um, Sam, do you want to uh, tell us who your colleague there is? I think she's in the chat room, um, but yeah, Megan. Well, well, this is the like I think Will said this is the the third book that Megan and I have done around this format. And um, what uh, Megan Scribner is, uh, she lives down in Tacoma Park, Maryland, and she is um, the consummate editor. I, what I always say about Megan is that um, everything she touches, she makes better. And it's an absolute, you know, kind of privilege and joy to work with her. We've worked on many, many writing projects together. Um, and this has been, a, you know, this, this experience of assembling this book has been incredibly powerful because, um, you know, the first one that we did 10 years ago really focused on teachers talking a lot about, you know, them trying to find steady footing in the work day to day. And um, what was, was really miraculous was that when we sort of assembled this book, the nature of the conversation included that um, about, you know, teachers trying to sort of make it through really huff, tough, hard days, um, you know, facing their vulnerabilities. But this one really explored, I think, some of the, the powerful trends that I think shape the experience of everybody in, in, that works as a teacher these days. Um, lots about the, you know, the press of accountability structures. A lot about um, how um, charter schools and you know new routes to the profession like Teach for America are shaping the experience of teachers in in the everyday practice, and uh, lots about you know how um, even about the the kind of new specter of teaching in schools that are no longer you know feel as safe as they once did with the new security measures and the the terrible tragedies. Um, like at Newtown. And so I think a lot of those, you know, sort of new realities that we all face in the profession sort of unfold in this book and the, the many different narratives um, that, you know, teachers share. And, and what's amazing to me about the book is just how poignant a story people can tell in 250 words. Um, and, you know, the, 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 and we'll, we'll probably read a few of them, but I'll, I'll just sort of give a little bit of a framework that the structure of the of the the book comes out of an old high school English assignment, um, and um, you know I was involved in the National Writing Project back when I taught in the late '80s in in New York City, and um, and the assignment was to for for high school students to find a poem or find a song lyric that mattered to them, and then show up and you know write a 250 word commentary that sort of explains their relationship to how that song you know or poem echoes in their head. And so that was sort of the, the you know, sort of the fundamental structure of the invitation that we sent out. Um, and so um, it's, a, it's a very powerful way to tell a broad range of stories across a lot of different people from a lot of different regions, although we've got a, a high intensity of Massachusetts folks here. We have people from about uh, 28 different states and all sorts of uh, moments across their career. Mm. So, Sam, what, yeah, I assume you were a high school teacher when you gave, or you made that assignment, that yeah. original assignment. Do you remember any uh, results or what your students wrote? Well, I think that, you know, a lot of, a lot of students, um, you know, pick different songs that mm -hmm. matter to them. Music is such a powerful and evocative thing for young people. They listen to the same song over and over again. And, um, you know, I can remember, um, you know, one kid who... who uh, wrote about Simon and Garfunkel's Sound of Silence. And this is dating back to about 1988, 1989, um, where, you know, he talked about, you know, trying to find his place, uh, a pensive song, a pensive commentary about, you know, trying to figure out who are his people. And, uh, you know, so there, there, there were a myriad of those kinds of things. Um, you know, some of the poems that people um, picked up on also were poems about, uh, you know, Emily Dickinson is a huge favorite of, of young people. Um, the, the poems of, um, of William Blake also seem to, you know, they like the enigma, the mystery of trying to figure things out. And so, you know, they're not too different than what teachers like. I think that, you know, people like rich, meaningful poems that, you know, deliver a poignant message about, you know, yourself and your identity and finding your place in the world. 
By the way, um, format here, which we hadn't discussed earlier, is open. Please interrupt. Please jump in. Is it, so, I, I did have a okay. question for Sam, Paul, since you opened that yeah. up. Yeah. So, so I was just curious, is when I was looking through the topics, um, yeah. the table of contents, Sam. So did you go in, like, having topics in mind, hoping that submissions would fall within them, or did you get these collections and you, Megan, said, okay, what do we have here, and started sorting out piles, and, you know, because oh, there's, yeah. like, a lot of advocacy and, uh, and some of the things you talked about there, so I'm just curious about the process to go through when, you, when yeah. you're looking at that. Well, I, it's a great question, Kevin, and, and the way that, you know, we ask, we ask a really open-ended question. Talk about how this poem matters to you and how you think about your life and work, and, you know, there are a few other... Um, you know, sub questions that go along with that, but that's the general, open-ended question. And what comes in is a is a broad range of submissions. And you know, we sit down with an editorial board um, that included about three or four other people, and we you know sort through and try and you know look for both a, a diversity of poem, a diversity of of commentary and story, um, trying to to you know match people so that we would have a a reach across the different um, years of, of one's profession. And then what we do is once we've, we've kind of identified or narrowed down the poems, we probably had an, you know, about uh, four to 500 submissions, which we you know, drew down to 90. Um, that's when we sort of you know, do a little bit of, you know, I think the word would be qualitative analysis. What we're trying to do is sort them into themes. Um, what are these commentaries and poems saying? And you know, that's where you know, um, these, these uh, these chapter themes uh, emerge from. So we have enduring impact is one of them where we, we talk about how teachers think a lot about um, what's the impact of their work. You know, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, testing and standardization and, um, you know, how do you make progress day to day and across a semester or a year. And that teachers really think about, you know, what's the impact that they have across the long stretch of a career. Are they making um, an imprint in a young person's growth and development? Um, another theme that bubbles up is the theme of, of tenacity, and we, you know, in that there are a lot of submissions where teachers talk about um, just how hard the work can be and how they often find themselves, I think as Will was explaining, you know, reaching deep at different times of the year to sort of reframe what's the big, large purpose and the overarching drive behind what they do each and every day. And, um, you know, um, and there's, a, there's another theme that, you know, I particularly love, and it's teachers talking about what drew them to the profession. Like, how did they know that they wanted to teach? I mean, I'm sure you've got a great story. You came to teaching later in life. I'd love to hear that, Kevin, um, because I think that that's so elemental to um, a teacher's sense of, you know, um, identity and a sense of how they, you know, frame why they come to work each and every day. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, who wants to be first to talk about their submission? <laughs> oh, come on, don't be shy. I'm happy to go. Um, okay, go ahead. So go. I, uh, well, so when I saw the call, I was trying to think of, you know, the poems that kind of st stick with you. I think that was what I was thinking about. They kind of resonate over time and, uh, and um, you know, had some meaning. And I kept coming back to um, uh, Taylor Molly and, um, you know, the poem he wrote about what teachers make um, is a poem that I brought into PD sessions and shared with uh, teachers. And at, at one point, I even bought one of his, he has his pens. He rolled them out. It's like a big scroll pen. <laughs> and on the scroll is the poem. And so I gave those gifts to teachers one year at my school, you know, for teachers I thought needed a little kind of pick me up kind of thing. Um, and so it's just kind of one of those poems, I think, that, can you get at the heart of um, of um, being questioned about why you're a teacher, particularly um, you know, um, at least in my circles, the public school teacher, um, and and how to kind of not defend it so much, but explain kind of why you come into it, and you know, this is part of the story, I guess, of why we're teachers is um, you know thinking of you know it matters that we touch the lives of kids, and it matters that you know what we do has impact in the years down the line that we don't always see this year that we're in, in if we're entering June <laughs> and everyone's going crazy. Um, but, um, you know, that idea of, uh, of laying out a rationale, I think. Um, and he does it with, obviously, um, a lot of humor and bite. Um, 
and kind of comes at it in a in a way that kind of stays with me. And I think uh, you know, I think watching him perform uh, the poem is much more powerful than kind of even reading on page. But um, you know, um, that poem was what I wrote about kind of staying with me. Um, I mean, I could read what I wrote. I don't know what how you want to go about it tonight, Paul. So yeah, it's fine. Know. You know, um, I, I'm sure there's no uh, copyright problems with us tonight. But I, I was, uh, but I was sitting here thinking, and Sam, maybe you could address how do you guys spend a lot of time getting permissions to publish the poems, or how does that work? Out? Oh yeah, that's a, a permissions to publish the poems. We we have a great system for that in place, and we had some really wonderful people that you know help coordinate that. But that's a big operation, um, and you know we uh, we work with the publisher, and uh, it's a very careful process, and it involves not just sort of getting permission, but making sure that you know the poem is exactly as the poet intended it to be, um, with the you know proper line breaks and you know all the kinds of things that go into the craft of poetry. That is you know so. It's precision language and precision layout. Um, I'd be interested to hear Kevin, um, yeah. you know, share share a little bit. Yeah, uh, because he's got a great, 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 a great poem and commentary. Uh, well, I can, you want so I can start read the commentary. Start with the poem. I think. Start with the poem. I think so. Yeah. It's pretty long. It's okay. <laughs> We've got time. All right, so I'll try to read. I can't do. Uh, yeah, I can't do him justice though. So. Yeah. Um, but this is called "What Teachers Make" by uh, Taylor Molly. He says, the problem with teachers is, what's a kid going to learn from someone who decided his best option in life was to become a teacher? He reminds the other dinner guests that it's true what they say about teachers. Those who can do, those who can't teach. I decide to bite my tongue instead of his and resist the temptation to remind the dinner guests that it's also true what they say about lawyers. Because we're eating, after all, and this is polite conversation. I mean, you're a teacher, Taylor. Be honest. What do you make? And I wish he hadn't done that. Ask me to be honest. Because you see, I have this policy about honesty and ass kicking. If you ask for it, then I'll, I have to let you have it. You want to know what I make? I make kids work harder than they ever thought they could. I make a C plus feel like a Congressional Medal of Honor, an A minus feel like a slap in the face. How dare you waste my time with anything less than your very best? I make kids sit through 40 minutes of study hall in absolute silence. No, you may not work in groups. No, you may not ask a question. Why I want to let you go to the bathroom? Because you're bored. You don't really have to go to the bathroom, do you? I make parents tremble in fear when I call home. Hi, this is Mr. Molly. I hope you haven't called at a bad time. I just want to talk to you about something your son said today. To the biggest bully in the grade, he said, leave that kid alone. I still cry sometimes, don't you? It's no big deal. And that was the noblest act of courage I have ever seen. I make parents see their children for who they are and what they can be. You know what I make? I make kids wonder. I make them question, I make them criticize, I make them apologize and mean it. I make them write, and I make them read, read, read. I make them spell definitely beautiful, definitely beautiful, definitely beautiful over and over and over again until they will never misspell either one of those words again. I make them show all their work in math and hide it on their final drafts in English. I make them understand that if you got this, then you follow this. And if someone ever tries to judge you by what you make, you give them this. He gives a finger. Here, let me break it down for you so you know what I say is true. Teachers make a goddamn difference. Now, what about you? That's his poem. Um, and then, so that's the poem that then I wrote my 250 words about. So here's what I wrote. A few times a year, I play poker with a group of lawyers, business owners, federal government employees, and software developers. Not long ago, one of them turned to me and asked, so what's it like to be a public school teacher? The question was asked innocently enough, but the emphasis on public and the unspoken meaning, why would anyone be a public school teacher, threw me off balance. I would have loved to have the wit of poet, uh, the wit of poet Taylor Mali and launch into a ferocious comeback worthy of his poem of what teachers make. I didn't. Instead, I gave a passionate defense of the impact I have on the lives of young people every single day, and then proceeded to win a few rounds of cards. Still, I could hear Mali's poem ringing in my ear. I'll share Molly's poem with other educators in many professional developmental development uh, sessions, and I've given the poem as a gift to colleagues. With its defiant tone, the poem becomes a token of solidarity, and I'm reminded of a quote from Charlie Parker that I use as a tagline for my blog, if you don't live it, it won't come out of your horn. The poem resonates with a similar message. As educators, we need to be proud of what we do and boldly confront misconceptions that surround us. 
it's almost as important as the work we do each and every day in the classroom. It's great stuff. Um, yeah, it's a nice kind of combination, I think. And yeah. I agree, the 250 how you, words. Um, how do you clap on uh, Google? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's okay. no app for that? Yeah, I'm sure there is. <laughs> I'm sure we can throw confetti and everything. <laughs> 12 emoticons. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, no, I was just saying that I know we're talking about like the, the 250 words really seems like a nice link. Um, you know, it's an oversized tweet, right? But that idea of uh, really, I had to really focus in on what the experience and also what I was thinking and tie it into that poem that still resonates a lot. So um, it was an interesting kind of writing experience. Was it much longer when you started, I assume, or how did you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was probably maybe you know twice the length, and then cutting it down, and um, I think even um, probably uh, Megan and Sam probably cut it down a little more too. Um, you know, it's that idea of yeah, of kind of narrowing the focus, I think, to make it get at the heart of what you're trying to say. <laughs> and I think you know tying that in with poetry, which is all about heart, is you know a brilliant kind of maneuver. Mm -hmm. Great. I'd be happy to share what I wrote. Um, this is actually um, an early draft of what actually made its way into the book, and this is an sort of interesting tie into what you were asking about earlier, Paul, about permissions for poems. The original poem that I chose was George Ella Lyons' Where I'm From, uh, which is a poem I use at the beginning of every school year with my students and I have them write their own versions and it's a you know it's a great uh, it's a great poem to start talking about figurative language um, with the students but really above and beyond that it gets the students talking about themselves and it gets me uh, you know thinking about who each of my students are um, as individuals so what ended up in the final book was actually Billy Collins on turning 10 and uh, luckily, I, and we, we had to go with that Billy Collins poem because for some reason, George L. Lyon's publisher, um, or George L. Lyon, you know, wouldn't let us use that poem, um, which is fine. Um, and the Billy Collins on Turning oh, 10 worked that's out That's amazing because really nice. it, it's, it's so available everywhere. Right? I know, <laughs> yeah. And maybe that's the reason. Maybe it's so overused. And, hmm. yeah, so... Okay. Uh, but still, I can't find the uh, the final draft of what made its way into the book. But this still has the the essence of of uh, you know what I submitted to the book. And I'm just going to read the first stanza from George L. Lyons' poem. So I am from clothespins, from Clorox and carbon tetrachloride. I'm from the dirt under the back porch, black, glistening. It tasted like beets. I am from the forsythia bush, the Dutch elm, whose long gone limbs I remember as if they were my own. So starts the poem, Where I'm From, by George L. Lyons. I use this poem at the beginning of every school year. I ask students to write their own version. Beyond the many lessons of figurative language, Where I'm From helps me get to know my students better. And as with all my other writing assignments, I write one too. This allows me to model the writing process and introduce myself. And when I write my own Where I'm From poem every year, I sift through a box on my desk where I keep notes and drawings from students letters or emails from parents, and other small artifacts that remind me of the high points in teaching. Something as seemingly small as a hand-drawn card from a student uh, telling me how they grew throughout the year, or thanks, by, thanks expressed by a parent in an email, can go a long way in those rainy days when the job just seems too hard, or there's more work to do than anyone could ever have time for. When I graduated from college, I wanted to be a musician, a documentary filmmaker, an owner of a recording studio, a world traveler. Uh, I wanted to be a million different things, but uh, teaching was not anywhere on my radar. When I tell old friends that I'm a middle school teacher, most laugh. The toy choice to teach is a surprise to most who know where I come from. Middle school, for me, was abysmal. I got bored and gave up. I made some poor choices and had to transfer schools. And in my experience, teachers were the enemies. I never had an adult look me in the eye and talk with me, except for when I made my regular trips to the principal's office. It wasn't until later that I had teachers who really got me, teachers who took the time to know where I was from. 
When I reflect on my experience growing up, I can't help but recognize the power of a teacher's connection with a student. It wasn't until high school when I experienced what it was like to have a great teacher. His name was Mr. Nucci, and oddly enough, he taught my least favorite subject, math. But he made the effort to know and understand me, and I can't think of a more crucial time in my life when I needed to be seen and understood by an adult who is not a parent. Not only did I begin to look forward to school, but I learned so much more. And I hope someday one of my students will even have half the respect and admiration as I have for Mr. Nucci. So it's not so much George L. Lyon's singular poem itself, but the countless poems that have been inspired in my classroom because of it. Where I'm from makes me more mindful of my identity as a teacher and the identities of my students. Where I'm from reminds me each of my students has their own story of where they have come from. And uh, this multiplicity of life stories keeps teaching fresh and exciting. New students every year, new groups of students to forge bonds with, new challenges, new students to watch grow and change. So obviously, I that that was a rough draft, and I had to cut it way down. For, and Megan and Sam helped me, you know, in a huge way with that. But that was sort of my initial first take on the submission process before it got refined. I was going to ask about that. So you you don't have to submit 250 words. You can submit longer, and then they'll work with you. Or how's that work? Yeah, that I mean, that was my experience. I just sort of wrote from the heart and what I, you know, felt like I needed to express. And uh, Sam and Megan, you know, helped me figure out what the most important parts were, you know, what I could leave out and what I, you know, had to keep in. And uh, so, yeah, that must have been my first submission to them, and then they, they helped me sort of fine tune it. Sam, what's that sound like for me? Well, it, it, it's it's you know hearing Will read it, you know, um, brings to mind how words that live on a page mean one thing, and then when you hear the cadence and rhythm of somebody's voice, you know, um, speaking it, it gives you a different level of of power, and it just strikes you in a in a way that uh, gets close to your bone. Um, and so I've worked with, with Will's piece, you know, for months that we kind of went back and forth, refining, shaping, um, you know, trying to get it to the 250-word limit, which is actually um, has to do with the size of the page um, as well, is that we, we have a, we're working within a, a constraint, and, and that constraint is, you know, sharp. Physical constraint. That's yeah, it's a physical constraint. And, you know, there's always that great um, saying, I think it's by Mark Twain, that if I had uh, more time, I would have wrote a shorter letter. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I think that that's part of the the task here. Um, and what we would do is, you know, when we would sit with these passages, we would, you know, sort of try and husk it apart and see, you know, what's the the, the power message here? What's the what's the story that's you know wanting to be told? And you know, in, and when you read a piece like Will's, um, you get a sense of just how um, he's trying to articulate um, how deeply this journey to become a teacher has been, you know, a real sojourn, and, and it's the kind of thing that, um, you know, strikes you as so important. We don't really talk all that much in the profession about, you know, why we landed where we landed or mm -hmm. how we were called to the work, and, you know, I think that that's one of the, the things is that poetry, and this is, um, you know, a principle that, you know, Parker Palmer talks about and his folks at the Center for Courage and Renewal. They talk about poetry as a powerful companion. They use the word third thing. Because what it allows you to do is it allows you to, when you're talking about a poem, speak your own truth, um, but do it through the poem in a way that, you know, maybe we don't necessarily feel comfortable with. But mm -hmm. the, the poem becomes a portal to um, speaking a real, enduring, personal message of your relationship to, to the work that you do each and every day. And I think that just shows up in, in so eloquently in both Kevin's piece where he you know, kind of brings us to a particular moment where he's sitting there playing cards and Will's piece where he, you know, wends us through his journey into into the work. So how, just a detail, and then um, Glendine will get to you. <laughs> Sorry. No. Um, how, how did that end up with um, with the, the other poem, though? So uh, from what I understood... Uh, when Megan or Sam or both of them contacted um, George L. Lyon or th their publisher, um, but I'm, I'm just wondering how your writing connects with. The so, 
the way that I sort of envisioned it was, well, I, I first just thought about what poems are important to me and what poems, you know, really sort of stick with me. And I guess, you know, what the poem, if I were to read the whole poem, um, I guess what George L. Line is getting at is, you know, we're made up of all these different people, places, ideas, experiences, you know, from our past that bring us to who we are today. And for me, you know, just a small snippet of who I am as a teacher is my experience as in middle school and also my experience finally having a teacher who I felt saw me and, you know, really heard me. Um, and those two things play into my life every day as a teacher. You know, it's my my hope that no kid that passes through my door into my classroom ever feels the way that I felt when I was in middle school, where I felt like I never had a teacher look me in the eye um, unless it, I was in trouble. I never want a student of mine to um, get bored at school. I never want them to, to essentially have the experience that I had in middle school. And I come back to Mr. Nucci, you know, as a teacher who really informed my work as a teacher. Um, and there are countless others who came along. Um, actually, I could say two others that came along after that that really stayed with me, who would be their own story in and of themselves. But uh, I guess the way that George L. Lyon's poem connects to my commentary is, you know, what sort of experiences I have that sort of help shape my identity as a teacher. And um, I think it's important to remember where you come from yeah, and so, why you're doing what you're doing. Well, I I get all that. That was all really useful. I'm, I'm glad you interpreted my question that way. But but let me j just ask this one more time. It's not that poem that appears in the book, though, right? It's another it's poem? It's not. That, no. So, so how did that work out? How, how did that revision oh, okay. process work okay. out? So, I, I don't give up. <laughs> I, I brainstormed some other poems that, you know, are, you know, useful to me in my everyday work as a teacher and, you know, speak to, you know, who I am as a person. And, you know, Billy, I love Billy Collins' poems. I use them in my classroom with my students. And I really love his poem on Turning Ten. You know, it's great for sixth graders. And so it's a poem that I'm really familiar with. And I think it... Uh, you know, it's been a while since I've gone back and looked at exactly how we adapted my commentary for that poem um, on Turning Ten, but I think the on Turning Ten speaks to some of the same underlying themes that I'm trying to get at in my commentary of um, growing up and um, becoming a, a new person, you know, sort of figuring out, you know, what I wanted my life to be like after all these experiences. And, you know, I wish I could speak more That's, thoughtfully or eloquently to that, but I guess the... That was pretty uh, eloquent. That's I, guess, I guess what it comes back to is Billy Collins' poem, um, certain lines in the poem speak to um, the same themes and the same messages that you know, I hope I am sort of getting across in my own short commentary. Makes perfect sense to me. So yeah. we should mention that the reason you don't have the book to read to us is um, uh, yet yeah, is it's coming out next week. Is that right, Sam? Yeah, it is, and and okay. I'm I'm leafing through because I've got a pre-release copy. I'll hold <laughs> it up go. right here. Just nice. here, and I'm putting my finger on. Um, Will Bangs' piece, and I'll just sort of read the first couple of paragraphs just to give you a sense of, of the flavor. And then you turn 11, 12, and 13, and all the dark blue speed really gets drained out of you. Middle school was abysmal for me. A measles of the spirit, a chicken pox of the soul. I didn't feel like what I learned was meaningful or worthwhile. I got bored and gave up. And so you can hear, you know, um, a, a, a re- positioning of those yeah. powerful themes that, that he talked about. And I'll just sort of um, read you the it last part of the assignment. Take, yeah. take, 
take the poem you started with and add a new poem. And <laughs> so that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, well, you know, I mean, I guess it you know comes back to you know um, you know those of people who who you know teach poetry and think about you know how uh, people encounter literature. You know, Lois Rosenblatt, that you know the great literary theorist who you know was so influential and for so many English teachers. I mean, she always said that you know. Um, poems and literature are, and I think I've got this, mere ink spots on the page until they connect with your own personal experience. And I think that that's sort of, you know, what the, the mojo of the book is, is that, um, you know, these poems are, are just, you know, these things that are out there. And then when, you know, somebody comes to it, uh, it gets refracted through their own personal uh, prism of experience and you know that's what bubbles up and that's what you know Kevin did with his poem and that's what Wills did with his poem and I think that we'll hear from Glendine in a second that she did the same thing in a, in a different way and told a different kind of a power story so um, I mean that's it I mean to me it's that alchemic reaction when a you know kind of a person comes to a piece of literature something ignites and you know what we try to do is capture that ignition in that 250 word commentary and, you know, that's why I think when people mess with this book, they, they don't even know whether to start with the poem or the commentary first um, because they're both, um, in some ways, these companion siblings. And, and I think that's kind of what makes the book um, different than a regular poetry anthology. Great. Sam, do you want to reintroduce Glendine? She's been here all along. <laughs> yeah, Glendine is, uh, well, I will tell you that Glendine is, you know, in the, the kind of work that I do, which is we see a lot of young people um, you know, join the profession. She's the kind of person that makes you feel that the, the profession of teaching and American education is in good hands because she's a dynamo and um, she has a great story about why given the fact that she could have done a myriad of things and been a superstar, she's picked teaching. And so um, she's a recent graduate, TFA core member, um, and doing great work in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and she can talk way better about all this than I can. You go, Glendine. Glendine, which part of New York are you from? I'm originally from the Bronx. Oh, which part? I teach in the Bronx. Oh, um, so Williams Bridge kind of border Mount Vernon and Wakefield, so pretty uh -huh. far up on a two line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I teach in the old Taft High School. So. Oh, okay. I'm familiar with Taft from yeah. when we were applying to high school ages ago. It feels right. like Bronx, Bronx in the house to make too. So. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so. Many of my experiences and like that led me to teach was because of my experiences in the Bronx and thinking about one year ago when I wrote this piece, I was in my senior year of college but it didn't really feel much like a senior year uh, because we were teaching full time um, and I was teaching 8th grade English uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts, a particular like urban neighborhood that actually resembled uh, the school that the eighth grade or the middle school that I attended in many ways and when this opportunity came to me we were actually in the middle of a poetry unit it was post MCAS uh, it was a time in which students got to be more creative we were focusing on narrative and on goals and dreams and overcoming odds and in talking about overcoming odds, we looked at like statistics um, and what statistics said that students of those demographics, of adolescents of those demographics, what they should be. And I saw that many of my students were buying into those statistics about what their outcomes could be, what their potential was, and it they, broke my heart. But these are mainly African American Latino students. Um, it was Latino? predominantly a Puerto Rican um, demographic, so Latino, um, and it broke my heart because once again, it was somewhere that I knew just eight years ago that I was in a school like that. Yet, because of tenacity, because of awesome teachers, um, because of awesome parenting, I was in a different position. I wanted my my students to know that they could attain that as well. So it's because of that experience and because of my personal experience why I chose the poem that I did and why I chose this profession. So my poem title is It Couldn't Be Done by Edgar, a um, guest. And initially my poem was going to be A Rose That Grew From Concrete by Tupac Shakur, but 
um, I ended up going with this poem instead because someone else had already snagged that. Um, I love so, the story behind the poem choice. This is <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nothing fancy, but this one I think actually works really well. Oh, Tupac, um, and, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Can we hear so, the poem? Is that, yeah. yeah. Somebody said that it couldn't be done, but he, with a chuckle, replied that maybe it couldn't, but he would be one who wouldn't say so till he tried. So he buckled right in with a trace of a grin on his face. If he worried, he hit it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. Somebody scoffed, oh, you'll never do that. At least no one has ever done it. But he took off coat and he took off his hat. And the first thing we knew, he had become it. He lift of his chin and a bit of a grin, without any doubting or quit it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. There are thousands to tell you it couldn't be done. There are thousands to prophesy failure. There are thousands to point out to you one by one the dangers that wait to assail you. But just buckle in with a bit of a grin. Just take off your coat and go to it. Just start to sing as you tackle the thing that couldn't be done, and you'll do it. Um, so from there, my, my 250 words picks up with, I asked my eighth grade class who wants to go to college. All of my students immediately raised their hands. I then asked, how many of you believe you can do it? Most of the hands fluttered down. I was just a student teacher, but at that moment, I recognized that classroom management and lesson planning weren't my only challenges. I had to motivate my students to believe that as long as they tried their hardest at a seemingly impossible task, the task could be done. For this message to be meaningful, I had to make it personal. To make an impact, I couldn't be Miss Hamilton. I had to once again be the young girl who had dreams of college in the midst of a school environment that didn't support that dream. I had to let them see me as a young immigrant girl being raised in a single parent household in the Bronx, watching my mom work relentlessly to provide for me while simultaneously encouraging me to study, to work hard in everything, and to dream. Education was never presented to me as a choice. It was presented and as an opportunity to shatter the statistics that would claim me as less than the potential that resided in me. I believe that there is nothing my students can't do. My job is to get my students to dream of a life and a future beyond what they know. I know they can do it, and I am the proof. So suddenly, common core alignment and lesson planning and unit planning and backwards planning just <laughs> was, was. I think you got another poem going there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> All the jargon. Um, just became jargon because these were actual lives and these were actual futures. And when I think about like why I'm called to that profession, and even as Will said, I not I don't think this is the hardest time, but even like when February is the hardest month and when October is the hardest month because we have multiple hard months. Um. I, I go to school every day now, why I went to school every day last year, and why I'll keep going to school and why I'll keep teaching is because somewhere, like, I know it can be done, um, and I know it will be done. So it's great to reflect on that. Yeah, and I think the act of writing these essays and hearing all three of us do it, I mean, it kind of solidifies our thinking, right, thinking about the writing as a way to kind of make sense of our world and and uh, make sense of our learning and who we are ourselves. I think probably even for those folks who didn't get, you know, the, they didn't get chosen to be in there, I mean, the act of writing kind of probably gave them an anchor into the poem and, and probably made it meaningful for them. Yeah. Paul, what poem would you choose? I never know. You know we are going to ask you that. I didn't, I didn't know that. I, mean, I have to think now. I have to pedal here for a minute. <laughs> I don't know. Poem, what, what poem would I choose? I have to think. I don't know. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Glendine, what was the Tupac poem that, or song that you started with? Yeah, so it was called A Rose That Grew From Concrete, and it basically mm -hmm. spoke about how 
a rose defy the odd of growing like a rough and like barren place um, w in which people thought that nothing good can come from concrete, you know, just slab. Um, but something beautiful came up out of it despite the adversity surrounding it. Uh, so that was actually our anchor poem for we were doing like a poetry and narrative unit in which our book was um, We Beat the Streets. Um, the author's name is um, slipped in me right now, but we were looking at that through the lens of poetry and also writing our own poetry to tell our own stories. Um, so it was an awesome unit that caused us to be really reflective and to be really honest with each other, with ourselves, our goals and dreams. And it was so good to get away from open response questions and MCAS writing to really like get to the heart of why education is important um, for me and for them. Hmm. I'm interested in how close the student writing is to our own writing in this experience. Sam, so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, with I think with the student writing, it it brought forth honesty that they also didn't know was within them. Um, you know, we didn't focus on like grammar and conventions until we were like getting ready for like probably our slam. But it was just about being honest and making our experiences really visceral. Um, and I think it, 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 especially giving them a poem as a framework really served as like a guide and like just a model for them to really just tap into something greater within themselves and to be honest. So we have uh, five or so minutes left. What, 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 what would you like us to talk about, <laughs> Sam? What are you thinking about? I, you know, I, I, Will's done so much with poetry and his students too. It'd be, you know, I'd like to have him um, reflect on the question that you just asked, Paul, which is, you know, um, what happens when you bring, you know, young people to poetry. And and I'm I, and I'm kind of asking specifically. Given this experience, how that's impacted what what you do with kids, if it has. But yeah, go ahead, Will. You can do whatever you want now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love um, you know helping students write poetry because it's just so different from you know what they're used to writing in their social studies class or their science class or even in you know, the vast majority of what they write in, in language arts. And I know for me as a student, um, you know, poetry was such, especially free verse poetry, and I guess that's what I'm really talking about and what I work mostly on with my students is free verse poetry. Um, it's really easy to draw the connection for them between, you know, the song lyrics that they love and that they listen to again and again and again like Sam was talking about, and the free verse poetry that they can write themselves. So there's a pretty easy buy-in for a lot of them. Um, you know, I do a similar sort of assignment um, where I have the students, um, you know, I say they can bring in a poem if they want, a poem that's meaningful to them, but uh, oftentimes, you know, they'll bring in song lyrics, and I, I tell them, you know, uh, lyrics are poetry, and the students often have a really close connection with the songs that they love. I mean, I really haven't had a class where, you know, a student just didn't have a song that really spoke deeply to who they are. And so to get the students to talk about, um, you know, a text to uh, self-connection or a text to world connection, um, or a text-to-text -text connection is, is really easy, and poetry is so great for that, especially because so many of the songs that they listen to are so um, near and dear to them for different, um, you know, for different reasons. So I really love using poetry with the students. It's a really great way to get them open, you know, to open up and talk about themselves and, and um, you know, use that, as Sam was talking about, um, use that as a springboard to really speak their truth, you know, and, and almost use that as a, um, use it as like a safe way to speak their truth because they really are basing it off of the song lyrics, but they're really talking about their lives and, and who they are. Um, 
I just want to check in with Glenn Dean, if you don't mind, on that, those similar issues, how you deal with poetry. Yeah, so um, I think Will is correct, especially allowing it to come forth from song lyrics. I think that's like a clear connection to them in which you can know, like, songs are poems in themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but they're automatically something that's a touch point because sometimes, and even with my sixth graders this year when we did poetry, they see, they immediately conceive poetry as something that is just really lofty and something that just doesn't make sense. Um, so what song lyrics allow it to just make even more sense to them because they know those things sometimes better than they know my vocabulary cards. Well, uh, and, and the opposite. They they know what the songs mean more than I do. Yep. <laughs> so they got to teach me what this stuff means. So. <laughs> that, that's true as well. Um, but just even in that process of writing, like speaking their truth and knowing that there is no right or wrong. And sometimes it's hard I noticed that that's sometimes hard for my students. Is is this right? Is is this okay? Is an often question um, that I get, and taking them out of that to figure out what's right for them, like how are you feeling, and to express that in a safe place um, has been really important and good for them. Kevin, what are you thinking? Um, I, I I see the same things with my kids too, and it, it always amazes me every year when we do um, you know our poetry that. Um, there's always a couple of kids that, you know, all they struggle with writing the rest, the rest of the year, it seems. And something clicks with them with poetry. It doesn't click with any of the writing we do. And it's every year. I'm, it's mm -hmm. this unexpected yeah. kid that, wow, you know, you're a poet, you know. And they don't, they don't see it in themselves until they start reflecting on what they've written. And, you know, it's that amazing discovery of, you know, of, the kind of writer inside themselves that just didn't come out with any other kind of ways of writing that we were doing. Uh, and that poetry opened up a door that just wasn't there for them, or they didn't see it, or, you know, and then, of course, how do we kind of move that into, so that that kind of writing voice comes out in other things, and, you know, it gets difficult because some of the assignments don't allow for that, you know. <laughs> so, um, but I always love those unexpected moments of, you know, you just wrote the most amazing poem for it all year, and you know they didn't even kind of realize it until they read it out loud or got reaction from other students or from the teacher. You know, that's a, it's a beautiful moment. You know, I, I'm struck by how what we've been talking about all evening here, though, is a nice way perhaps to pull the poet out into other kinds of writing. Right? Write about poet. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Will, are you are you a sixth grade teacher too? I am, yeah. Oh, we got sixth grade in the house. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. about the fourth time I've used that metaphor. I apologize. Um, so I teach sixth grade too. That's funny. Oh, you know, no sixth way. Grade teachers here, and Sam, you're a sixth grade principal. We, so we got a sixth. We got a sixth grade at our school. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I know. So th this is uh, funny. <laughs> Very cool. Um, we should just go around and um, any last quick last thoughts anybody has. Uh, it's been <laughs> lovely just listening to you um, tonight. Uh, Glendine, do you want to start us off? Yeah, uh, so I think joining this conversation and hearing the poems from um, Will and Kevin and just connecting with Sam again, it really does like put our work in perspective. Sometimes it can be so isolated where we're in the context of our schools and in our districts and just our own classrooms for 70 minutes. Um, and it's to, this like has given me so much life. It has like filled, filled my heart to just join this conversation tonight and to just remember that when I'm not in this alone <laughs> um, and to <laughs> that, <laughs> Our, our purpose is so much greater than ourselves. Um, so, thank you. Nice. Uh, Kevin. I mean, I would guess, I would say that, uh, you know, being able to talk about poetry is, is really a powerful experience. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the many travesties of the Common Core, I would say, is the, you know, the reduction of poetry as part of you know, how they see text. And, and I know our state was one that put it back in. Um, and I'm thankful for that, and um, part of that was the lobbying of our writing project to kind of make that happen, which, um, you know, is 
is a nice reminder, but uh, you know, I worry about states where it wasn't put into their standards, and where poetry is probably maybe not forgotten completely, but um, not where it should be in, in the minds of, and hearts of kids. Yeah, and this is too much to say at the last minute, but uh, the quote that Sam did earlier from Louise Rosenblatt um, and connecting that to poetry, I, you know, she wouldn't have been a friend of the Common Core either, I don't think, because they're saying the stuff is right there on the page, you just have to get it out, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a really different philosophy than Louise Rosenblatt, I think. Um, at least my interpretation <laughs> is what you play that. Will, uh, and then I'm, Sam, I'm going to give you last word. Any thoughts here? Yeah, I, I also would, you know, like Lindine said, I, you know, it was a really nice conversation to have, and uh, unfortunately, these kinds of conversations don't happen nearly um, often enough, especially within our own schools, within my own school, and amongst my colleagues, just because we have so much, mm -hmm. you know, so much that's given to us um, that doesn't, and there's not enough time to talk about these really important. Um, issues and who we are as teachers and why we do what we do. Um, and I guess one of my takeaways, you know, from taking extra time to be a part of this um, anthology and this collection of poems is it's just so important to remember the threads that keep you holding on. Um, you know, whether it's looking back on your own experience, as for, like for me, my own experience as a student and the teachers that inspired me or, you know, my experience as a student and wanting to change that for my student, we're always going to get so many things thrown our way as teachers and you just always have to remember those things that will keep you going the next year and the next day and, and really remembering the, the ultimate goal of, you know, why we're doing what we're doing and try and keep it all in perspective. So, um, this is a nice way to help refocus and bring back those um, important ideas and questions about why we teach. How many days till you finish, Will? June 25th. June 25th, okay. Yeah. You'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> Sam, uh, where can we get the book and any last thoughts first? Though? Uh, it's you get books where you know Amazon, independent booksellers, Wiley, all that stuff. Um, it's okay. it's you know getting ready to launch, but you know the, Parker Palmer wrote the forward to the book, and he starts with an epigraph by William Carlos William. Um, it is difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. Yeah. And you know just sort of you know, putting a recap on all the beautiful things that were just said right now. Um, you know, I'm really struck by what comes out, what's found in this book and what's found in the voices that we just heard is really, you know, the search to keep, you know, that stuff that we find in poems, you know, about heart and inspiration and tenacity and, you know, finding ways to sort of keep on reaching out, all those things that I think students respond, you know, so compellingly to, um, that are so central to our work, but to maybe so diminished in the public policy discussions about what, you know, what we do in our work in schools. And so, you know, I think that that's the, the, the sort of utility of this book, to use a, you know, kind of a word that maybe you don't normally think about when you think about with poetry, but the utility of poetry is to kind of draw us back to those things that get found in poems, which are how do they speak to, you know, those really, um, you know, sort of shadowy but indispensable qualities that, you know, make a classroom come alive, that make um, a relationship with a colleague come alive. And, and I think that that's what, you know, kind of sings throughout this book is, is, you know, teachers touching back to those, you know, most kind of primal sort of visceral emotions and capacities that, you know, are, are, would animate them each and every day. And, and when they're not there, they, they feel its absence. And uh, so I think that that's what this book is most about. And I think that we heard it in, in the voices of Kevin Glendine and Will tonight. And, you know, I think you, you flip the pages of this book and you hear it from their colleagues as well. Very cool. Well, Sam, let me just personally thank you first. I, I know how hard a principal's job is and to put this on top of that, thanks for coming tonight. And of course, uh, the three um, 
the three others here. Thank you for coming and uh, joining us. Um, by the way, uh, this is a community that is here every Wednesday night, so if you're uh, <coughs> looking for more connection, uh, join us any evening um, on Wednesday uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern and 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. Um, we are um, a broadcast of the World Bridges Network um, at uh, teacherstpteachers.org and at edtechtalk.com. Um, and uh, this this will be up right away, though, um, at uh, on YouTube. Uh, you search and you can find it there or right here at edtechtalk.com slash ttt. Um, thank you all, and we'll see you again great. soon. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Right. Paul, thanks thank for running. That's great. Thank thanks, you, Paul. Sam. Thank you. Bye, Bye guys. Bye, Will. Bye, Kevin. Bye. Bye. Good night, everyone.